I'm glad to be here with all of you. I'll tell you briefly my story and my background. Uh, I am an attorney, uh, but I don't practice mesothelioma litigation. Uh, I actually do estate planning and elder law in Kentucky. Uh, I'm also a bereaved. My mother was diagnosed with mesothelioma in 2014 and received treatment around the country at some of these great centers where you've met some of these healthcare providers here. And she passed away in 2016. And one of the fantastic things about being here and hearing all of this information and meeting all of you uh, is to see how much progress has been made since 2016 in this space and will continue to be made. Um, my mother was adamant that I um, volunteer or stay affiliated in some way with the Mesothelioma Foundation and it has been my honor to do that um, in these years. So I'm delighted to meet all of you all and, and be here as well. So this topic about litigating um, your mesothelioma claims for patients and for families um, is, a, is a big one. And we at the foundation, we don't internally have the expertise on this topic, but we wanna make sure and address this topic for patients and families and get you information about it. So that's why we're having this here today. Um, so our first speaker, Don Besserman, is with the MRHFM law firm. And their firm uh, has a large practice in asbestos litigation. Uh, their firm has about 10 offices in a number of states uh, with over 60 lawyers who practice in this area. Uh, Dawn decided to move south for sunnier weather and uh, continue her law practice. So I enjoyed getting to know her and talking about that some. So Dawn is going to speak to you first and go through some slides. And after she finishes, I'll come back up and introduce you to the other members of the panel. And we'll go into the Q&A session at that time. So Dawn, thank you for being here. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Cheryl said, my name is Dawn Besserman. I am a partner at the law firm MRHFM. Uh, we are a litigation firm that specializes only in handling mesothelioma claims on behalf of mesothelioma patients and their family. I'm gonna be talking to all of you today about a simple overview of the legal process. And like Cheryl said, when I get finished giving you all an overview of the legal process, uh, my partner Neil and uh, another attorney from the Gory Law Firm will be joining me to answer any questions that folks may have. Um, so to get started, um, the first thing that patients always want to know when they reach out to us and have questions about the legal process is what is the type of compensation that's available for me and my family? Um, you know, what are the, the sources of compensation and funds that are available um, to help victims and their families deal with medical bills and just to seek compensation for their losses, their damages, what they're going through in terms of their pain and suffering, um, lost wages if uh, the victim is still working. Um, the spouse also has what's called a loss of consortium claim. The law recognizes that spouses of injured parties suffer their own sort of damages and um, the law provides that that the spouses also have a right to recover when a, um, a spouse is injured so there are really three different types of compensation that is available for victims and their families and the first one is the one that most people think of when they think of mesothelioma claims um, because it's often what we see on television commercials and that is the trust funds that have been established for mesothelioma victims and their families. 
Uh, the second type of compensation that is available are what are called solvent claims. And these are claims that can be filed in civil court. So we refer to them either as solvent claims or civil claims. But these are claims that are filed at a civil courthouse um, against various companies and defendants. Uh, the third type of compensation that's commonly available to mesothelioma victims and their families is VA benefits for persons who were exposed to asbestos during the course of their military service. Um, so I'm going to go through each type um, just generally and give you a little bit more information about the three different types of compensation. Um, with respect to the trust claims, um, the trust claims are essentially uh, trusts that have been established through the bankruptcy court system. Um, when a company that has manufactured products that contained asbestos uh, begins to face liability in the civil courts and cases historically have been filed against a number of companies repeatedly because they had so many products on the market or their products were so prevalent there are so, they're just hundreds of cases that are filed against these companies. Eventually, there are so many cases against particular companies that they become bankrupt. And what that means is that their liabilities exceed their assets. So these companies have gone to bankruptcy courts and petitioned for relief. And what that relief is, is they are no longer allowed to be sued in civil court. But in exchange for that, they have to put aside assets in a trust fund. So funds are set aside in a trust fund. Those funds are managed by an independent trustee, not the company. The company no longer has access to those funds. And those funds are managed for the benefit of mesothelioma victims and their families going forward. The trusts are established and set up and managed so as to hopefully compensate all of the projected victims who were exposed to that company's products. Um, trust claims are administrative claims. Uh, they're not associated with a court or a lawsuit. Uh, there is no court appearance required to pursue trust claims. Um, generally, the evidence that is used to support trust claims are affidavits, which are essentially sworn statements by either the victim who can discuss particular asbestos-containing products that they worked with throughout their lifetime. Um, sometimes when the victim himself or herself doesn't know those products, um, you can get evidence and affidavits supported by coworkers or family members who have that information. And um, there are some trusts that have been established where you don't even have to know the name of the product. Um, you may qualify for a claim based solely on the fact that you worked at a facility or a site where their product is known to have been so prevalent that the trust recognizes if you worked there, you were likely exposed to that product. Um, there have been over 40 national trust funds that have been established, um, and there are always more trusts that are being established. Right now, there are several companies that have filed for bankruptcy protection, and those bankruptcies are working their way through the bankruptcy court system. Um, so there will likely be additional trusts that are established in the future as well. The second type of claims, like I mentioned, those are the solvent claims that are filed in civil courts. Um, these claims are claims against companies that haven't sought bankruptcy protection and that are still in existence and can be sued as a corporation in, um, in our civil court system. These claims can be substantially more valuable than the trust claims. Um, the solvent claims are typically more valuable because there is a lot more risk involved for the defendants. Um, when you file a, a claim in civil court, uh, there is ultimately the potential that you're going to have a civil jury sit and hear the evidence and make a decision. And if they decide in favor of the mesothelioma victim and their family, um, generally the damages that are going to be awarded can be substantial. Um, and that is what causes the companies to value those claims more and potentially pay more. Um, so. 
it, it's a very different system in the civil court system as opposed to the, the trust claim system. Um, in the trust claim system, there is not that threat of a civil jury. Um, the claims are managed by a trustee and the amounts are determined by the trust. The, the amounts that are paid out are not something that is generally negotiated, um, as is the case with solvent claims. Um, solvent cases are much more time intensive for the lawyers um, and to a lesser degree for the um, mesothelioma victim. Um, and these claims have to be proven by either deposition testimony or documentary evidence. Um, so there's a lot more work that is involved in preparing those cases for trial. Uh, generally, these types of cases also involve the hiring of experts and um, depositions of multiple witnesses, not just the victim, but often coworkers, family members, um, like I said, experts and other potential witnesses. The third type of recovery that may be available to patients and their families are VA disability benefits. Um, these benefits are, again, available only for people who served in the military and were exposed to asbestos during the course of their military service. Um, disability benefits um, for mesothelioma get a rating of 100% disability through the VA. Um, and those benefits, if they are granted, continue for the life of the mesothelioma victim. Um, so once those benefits kick in, that is a monthly benefit that continues until the victim passes away. Uh, the evidence needed to support a claim with the VA can be either through deposition testimony that's taken during the civil case um, and or affidavits from either the uh, patient or from coworkers in the military who have evidence uh, about the exposures that the person had. Current VA disability benefits are over $3,000 per month for a single veteran, over $3,500 a month for a married veteran. And then if the veteran passes away, the spouse will continue to get a benefit um, in the amount of currently over $1,400 per month. And that continues until either the spouse remarries or passes away. So the most common question that we get when we explain to patients these different types of compensation that are available is, well, how do I know which claims I qualify for? And what if I don't know how it was that I was exposed to asbestos? And that's where your law firm really comes into play in terms of developing the evidence and doing the investigation. Um, everyone's case is different, and every case requires a serious investigation. And the investigation is going to involve taking a complete history of the patient from birth all the way through, you know, present day. So uh, we try to uncover every potential source of exposure that someone had throughout their lifetime. And of course, that can be quite an undertaking, but, you know, we have tools that will allow us to piece together that information and make a determination as to where we think your case will, will fall within those three types of compensation that are available. Some patients will be able to have trust claims, solvent claims, and a disability claim. So they're not mutually exclusive. Some people have all three. Some people may have just solvent claims. They don't qualify for any of the bankruptcy claims for various reasons. Uh, maybe that is a very young patient who um, isn't going to qualify for the trust because their exposures happen so recent in time that there is no trust fund available for them. Um, and they may only be able to file a solvent claim. Uh, they may not have served in the military. Now, some folks will have, like I said, a combination of all three types of compensation available to them. Some folks may only have trust claims. Um, everyone is different. And, and we can't make a determination as to what a person is going to qualify for until we do a really complete and thorough investigation. Um, and what we'll find is that every exposure matters. So with 
mesothelioma. We know that it is um, a disease that is a dose response disease and it is a product of a person's accumulation of exposures throughout their lifetime. So every exposure to asbestos is something that contributes to cause the disease and every contributory exposure to asbestos is a potential source of recovery for a victim. Um, there, typically, someone who has mesothelioma has been exposed to asbestos in a myriad of ways and through different products. So there are a lot of options available in terms of compensation. That's not for everyone, but, but it's a very common situation. Um, and for people who worked in an office setting, um, you know, that's, that's generally, or as a teacher, um, or as a nurse, they, they think to themselves, well, I, how did I get exposed? I didn't work in an industrial site. I wasn't an insulator. You know, how could this have happened? Well, asbestos was so common and in so many products, um, you could have been exposed by patching a wall before painting. You know, if you're a mom and you like to decorate and change up the house, but you've got three kids, three boys that, you know, run through the house and they're constantly nicking up the walls and you buy a joint compound uh, to patch up those walls before painting the house. You've probably been exposed if you did that work prior to 1978. Um, changing brake pads on your car or being present when your dad did that in the garage. That there's a potential exposure there. So it's not just occupational. Um, and as we've learned over the last several years, uh, talc historically was contaminated with asbestos. So there are a myriad of products now that we know contained asbestos that several years ago we really didn't have as a, an understanding as to how that um, exposure happened or how, how a person was exposed to asbestos. Now we look back and we see that there are people, women who've used um, cosmetic dusting powders on their body for 20 years and that that's their primary source of exposure. Um, so it's really important that you speak to an attorney, even when you don't think that you were exposed to asbestos or you can't figure out in your own head, you know, how was I exposed? You need to talk to an attorney, someone who has the expertise and can take you through all these potential routes of exposure. Because if you were exposed, if we can figure out what that exposure is, there is a potential for financial recovery there. Um, literally thousands of products have contained asbestos over the years, so there are thousands of ways that people have been exposed to asbestos. Um, one of the common concerns at the outset of our representation of clients is what kind of time commitment is required? You know, people want to focus on their health and their medical treatment as they should. They, you know, this is a time in your life when you don't want to be dealing with lawyers. You want to be focusing on your medical care and your treatment. We respect that. We understand that. Your lawyer is going to work around your treatment schedule. Your treatment comes first. Um, your lawyer is going to come meet with you in, their, in your home where you're comfortable and at a time that works for you. Um, everyone has the ability to to make that time commitment that works for them. So there, there may be situations where we have clients that don't want to spend a lot of time involved in a lawsuit. They don't want to give a deposition. They don't want to do that. Well, you do have options. You can just pursue bankruptcy trust claims if that's available to you. Um, and, and that takes a lot less time, a lot less effort. Um, but it's important to understand that there, there are different levels of time commitment and everyone's different. And you can work with your lawyer to find that balance that works for you. Um, a second concern often is people aren't, you know, they're, they're court averse, they're legal averse, they, they're intimidated by the legal process and or they don't want to go inside of a courtroom. And again, that's a decision that you can make. There are ways that you can obtain compensation um, that don't require you to sit through a courthouse to go through a lengthy court trial. Um, there are certainly different options, so don't let that preclude you from at least pursuing um, what your options are and considering those. Another common question is how long is this process going to take, right? Um, it's going to vary. Uh, there are a myriad of factors that come into play. Uh, 
trust claims, they generally take several weeks to several months to process after we've got done our investigation and or gotten affidavit signed and submitted in support of those claims. Solvent claims is a completely different story. It can vary widely based on where your case is filed. Um, some jurisdictions, you can see your case go to trial within nine months of filing. Others, depending on where that jurisdiction is and what the court backlog is, it can take up to three years. Um, but again, even though that process may take a long time, there are generally multiple defendants in a case and there will likely be settlements along the way. Um, so so the, the time is so variable. It can go from several weeks to a few years. Um, VA claims generally take several months to process. Um, you're dealing with the government, so it's really up to them <laughs> and their timetable. Um, but generally, those claims take several months to process. One of the important things to understand about the VA claims is once you know, once your lawyer knows that you were or believes that you were exposed in the military, the first step is to notify the VA that you intend to file a claim on behalf of your client. And that notice starts the clock ticking on the benefits so that although you may not have all of the evidence needed to completely file that claim right now, we tell the VA right now, hey, we're gonna file this claim on behalf of our client Joe. And then we're gonna go back, we're gonna work up Joe's case, develop all the evidence that we need, and then we fully file that case six months later on behalf of Joe. If the VA approves his claim, then the benefits start six months prior to when we first notified them. So with the VA, it's very important to get the clock going and get the clock ticking as quickly as possible. So you want to notify them as soon as you can because each month of benefits is over $3,000 a month. So that adds up very quickly. Um, so you don't want to delay filing your VA claim. Medical insurance liens is another common concern uh, among our clients. Um, generally, if you are able to obtain settlements, um, your medical insurance company, including Medicare, may have the right to try to seek reimbursement for a portion of what they paid um, as it relates to your medical care and treatment for mesothelioma. Um, that is something that often uh, causes concern for patients, but you should keep in mind that your attorney will handle the negotiation of those liens. They will work to reduce those liens to as little as possible and sometimes get them completely waived. Um, and it's something that your law firm will handle for you. It's not something that the client necessarily needs to be concerned about personally. They don't have to deal with it. That's what the attorney is for. Um, and another common question and issue that comes about when we're talking to potential clients is how do I know which law firm to choose? You know, I've talked to lawyers from various firms and it, it's overwhelming. How do I, how do I make that decision um, as to why law firm A is better for me than law firm B? And you know, what factors should I be looking for in a law firm to represent me? There are a number of objective factors that patients can look at um, when making that decision. And the first one I think is the most important is experience. What is that firm's experience? Um, you know, how long have they been around? Who are their lawyers? Get on their website, look at their attorneys and see what their experience level is. Um, the size of the law firm matters, right? Um, most of the companies that are sued in mesothelioma cases are large corporations. Um, corporations that we've all heard of like General Electric, Honeywell, um, giant corporations, right, that have unlimited resources when it comes to defending legal claims. You don't want a small local firm with one or two attorneys handling that type of a case. And the reason why is because they're gonna get buried 
in paper. They're gonna get buried by the number of lawyers working on behalf of the corporation. You want a firm, you want an attorney that has the resources available to go up against giant corporations. Um, and then there are also objective factors like the Better Business Bureau. You can inquire to see if that firm has a rating with the Better Business Bureau. You can go on state websites and look at the, the bar and see whether their attorneys um, have been disciplined. Um, you can, you know, there are objective ways to look at the firm and make decisions based on those objective factors. There are also other factors that you should inquire about when interviewing law firms. Um, you know, one of the, the best things to ask a potential lawyer who, who wants to represent you in these types of claims is, does your firm handle other types of litigation? Um, are you specialized? You know, is the, the lawyer that is going to be working on my case somebody who only handles mesothelioma claims? Or are they going to be working on car accidents and medical malpractice and, um, you know, pharmaceutical claims and all of these other things? This is the type of specialized litigation where you want a specialized attorney, someone who knows the ins and outs of mesothelioma claims. You should also ask a potential law firm, who's gonna be working on my case? Is it going to be a partner, a senior attorney? Is a partner going to be involved in my case from the very beginning? Or am I gonna be working with uh, a young associate with you know one or two years of experience and that isn't working under, um, in a team situation with a partner that it knows what they're doing and is supervising and uh, coordinating the litigation for you. Um, you should also ask if you are a military veteran, ask whether that firm will handle your VA claim for you. Not all law firms will handle VA claims. Um, our firm does and a lot of them don't. So that's something if you have a potential VA claim, you want your firm to be handling that claim because you want the evidence that's submitted as part of that VA claim to be consistent with your other claims that the law firm is pursuing for you. You don't wanna file the VA claim on your own or work with a representative from the VA um, who may volunteer to help you with us, um, assisting in the, the filing of those claims. You really want a law firm that's gonna handle all of the claims to make sure that everything is consistent. Um, you should also ask a potential law firm whether they have handled cases involving the same work sites that you worked at. Or um, if, if you were in the military, did, have you handled cases um, for people that served on the same naval ship that I did? Um, have you handled cases involving the same products that I was exposed to? You want someone that has experience. Um, with your particular exposures. Um, in addition to that, you want someone who has the resources, who's handled those types of cases and has, for instance, prior documents from that um, site where you worked for 20 years. Uh, if, if, you've, if I've already worked up a particular location and I've got all of the documents about where the different asbestos-containing products were located and um, you know where they were purchased and who the suppliers were, that's something that's going to benefit you in your case. Likewise, if I've worked up a case at a location where you, you worked for 20 years and I've got five prior depositions of workers from that location, all of that evidence can be used in your case and will help your case be more successful. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Dawn. So we'll go ahead and have our other attorneys come up here now too. So joining Dawn is going to be Neil Mowney. And Neil uh, began the firm, MRHFM, and is the managing partner. And so he's coming up right here. And then Greg Sandifer is coming as well. And he is with the Gorey firm um, and works uh, out of the St. Louis office. Um, so all three of these attorneys are very experienced and welcome the questions that you have. 
Um, I'm sure you understand that anything they tell you today is general information and you know not specific legal advice. There's a lot to know about what your your case would be. Uh, but please go ahead. We've got microphones. Um, there's a microphone here, and I'll walk around with one as well so we can make sure and hear folks. So what questions do you all have? Oh, here I come. Marissa? Um, first, thank you for coming today. I just had a question, uh, again, about the medical liens and how that is affected once an asbestos exposure case becomes a wrongful death lawsuit and how they can, are able to continue to pull those liens out. No, first question, I throw a tough one. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Well, so you, you know one interesting thing about things with medical liens, I, I've been, I'm older than these two, unfortunately. <laughs> and and I, I've been an attorney since 1989, and 20 years ago, we never dealt with medical liens. And this is something now, unfortunately, it's occurring all the time. But, but you want to go ahead and... Sure, sure. When there is a wrongful death case, um, there's also likely going to be a, a survival claim as well, which is going to involve the estate, so that when that person passes away, their medical bills are part of the estate, and that has to be paid back if there are lien and or liens on that. Um, so that's, that's how that works. Um, it, it's not a situation generally where if someone passes away, all of a sudden those medical liens are extinguished, they're still, they're still there. And if settlements have been reached on behalf of the victim during their lifetime, those are certainly subject to the liens, right? Um, so, so you may have a situation too where you, you settle with a particular defendant while the patient is alive and then they pass away before those funds are distributed and those are also gonna be subject to, to the lien. Does that answer your question? So we, we actually have a medical liens department and that's all they do is handle medical liens. And so it's really become a, a complex part of everyone's case now. And so it's just something we deal with. And, it, and if an insurance company is involved and they're paying for, for any of the medical bills, they're gonna try to get paid 100 cents on the dollar. They, they always do now. And so it's just a, a part of every case now. Typically, it's a little better if Medicare is paying it or something like that, but the insurance companies are aggressive now in trying to get paid. But there, there are also programs, too. So, so the repayment of those medical liens, there are different programs that different law firms have negotiated with various insurance companies to keep those liens down or to, to keep them at a minimum, or sometimes they'll even agree, agree to waive them. Um, so there are options. And, and hopefully, you know, the lawyer is, knows what they're doing and is negotiating those liens down as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, uh, we have another, another question? question? All right, Maya will bring the microphone. Again, thank you. Sorry. Thank you again for being here. I'm curious to know if you have any experience with any um, um, uh, workman's comp settlements, any companies that want to settle as a workman's comp claim, and how far back that can go. Yeah, work comp is going to vary by state. We certainly, we certainly can settle in, in states that are, that are favorable to that a work comp claim in association with the asbestos claim. So, and it, it, that's going to vary by state. I think Neil can probably add to this. Some states are very favorable and, and we aggressively pursue the comp claim if there's a premise or an employer to go against. But some states are not very favorable for that type of action, but I think most, most good firms will still get that worked out against that premise, against the, the, the target of that, that would have been a, the target of the work comp claim. So we will get it worked out. All, all good firms will still get that worked out. But I think very few states, Neil, you correct me if I'm wrong, but are still work comp favorable. 
Um, yeah, I, I generally think that's true. Fortunately, there's some states where you can still sue your employers, and and so that's an advantage. Like Louisiana and Pennsylvania are a couple of examples. Um, but yes, you had a follow up. Sorry about that. To be more clear, if the patient is no longer employed, if this would have been an exposure when employed, say, 20 years or more ago, I'm curious to know what that would look like if they come back, if it's a potential source of exposure, and they come back saying that they want to handle it as a workman's comp claim. I'm curious to sure. know, is that possible? And if it is, what does that look like? It, it can be un, under certain states' law if that was their last employer, okay? Um, but it varies because some states have a specific statute of limitations that you're not going to be able to go back 20 years. And so sometimes that, that, um, that last employer won't be liable under workers' comp laws. But it, it just does depend, and, and that's one of those areas where every state kind of handles it somewhat differently, unfortunately. Um, you know, that's something you have to look into and get more information. We have a number of questions coming from our live stream. Uh, one of them sort of along the line of conversation right now. How many years after the original filing can the independent medical company or Medicare keep asking for new reimbursements if the patient is still alive? I don't, I don't think there's any limit on it, is there? Um, there's generally not a limit as if they're continuing to treat. I'm sorry, yeah. can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's generally not a limit on that, but one of the things that we do for our clients when we can is negotiate that lien in full so that um, if, for instance, Medicare has a, a, a valid interest in seeking recovery, we will negotiate with Medicare to end the lien process. We're going to pay X amount of dollars and then it's over, right? They're not, they're not going to keep coming back to you. We can do the same thing with private insurance companies generally. We can't force them to do it, but a lot of the companies will negotiate those liens so that they have finality. Um, but there is not necessarily a limit on future settle or I'm sorry, future medical liens. Um, uh, oh, you do. Okay, I have more questions from the live stream. Oh, okay. if you want to do that first. Um, sure, I have a couple of questions um, about the statute of limitations. Uh, is there a, a statute of limitations for measles claims? And another question is that that wonders if that limit is two years from diagnosis. So it's often two years, but it depends on the state again. Um, California for a personal injury case, it's a year, um, but then it's also a, a year from the, the date of death to bring a wrongful death case. And, and it, that's just one example, but there are some states with three years, a lot of states with two years, but it varies. And um, in some states, they'll allow that statute of limitations to begin to run at the date of death for a wrongful mm -hmm. death case too. Uh, but that's, again, it's going to vary from state to state. <clears throat> Thank you. It's on. It's on. Okay. <clears throat> if uh, this litigation process is, <clears throat> if we go forward with it and the, the person with mesothelioma dies, should the spouse continue to do that? Because well, in your payouts it said, you know, three, possibly three years. Possibly three years. So if, it's, if the process has started and that person passes away before you know, you have before, to before all the claims court. are paid out. Right. Should Tip they continue to do that, or is it just when that person dies, it's a dead duck? They, they, they should, should continue to do that. Now, now hopefully, <laughs> if you have a specific example where someone's gone forward with something and filed claims, hopefully things like if they needed to get a deposition done of the plaintiff, or they needed to get affidavits prepared to file those for trust fund claims, hopefully that's already completed. And if it is done, then those claims can be filed and they can be settled and paid out, even though the person has passed away. Maya? Yes, ma'am. There's another question over here. Thank you. Any comments or update on the Johnson & Johnson situation? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> all right. So that, that for, for people that don't know, Johnson & Johnson, which is a $460 billion corporation or something like that, has, in their infinite wisdom, claimed that they're bankrupt. And uh, they filed 
and what uh, lawyers like us affectionately re recall a Texas two-step. They filed, what, what they did is they moved the entire corporation from New Jersey to the state of Texas, and then in the course of less than a day, divided up into two corporations, one being LTL. They put all of their asbestos liabilities in LTL, then they moved, um, and I, I think they put half a billion dollars or something like that in the LTL, then moved Johnson & Johnson back to New Jersey, and then moved LTL to North Carolina, where they filed for bankruptcy protection, um, claiming that their asbestos liabilities of LTL exceeded the value of the company. So it, it, it's a maneuver that a number of companies have now tried. The latest is that um, we have, our firm's been involved in this, and we've been fighting this aggressively, because if they can get away with it, then every corporation can get away with this type of maneuver. Um, so the bankruptcy judge in, in New Jersey, the North Carolina action, um, we were successful in getting that transferred to New Jersey. The bankruptcy judge there unfortunately ruled against us, but the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit, has taken on the action and they're gonna hear an appeal, and now that appeal is, is going to be heard September 19th. We actually have reason of, to feel good, to feel positive about it. We think we can get that reversed. And if nothing else, um, there's, there's currently an injunction in place that prevents us from suing Johnson & Johnson. If nothing else, if we can get the injunction reversed where we can continue litigation against Johnson & Johnson, that, that'd be a big win for us. We'd take that. So, that. so that's the latest. I mean, stay tuned, September 19th, that's the hearing date. We'll probably have a better idea of what's gonna go on after that. Um, I believe uh, they're also going to allow, it's the Department of Justice, they're allowing yes. them to argue at that hearing also. And so I think the Department of Justice is also going to get 15 minutes to argue on our behalf. We, we're happy about and so we'll see. We'll see what happens. Other questions in the room? We have a few more from the live stream, so I'll, I'll go ahead on to those. Um, since asbestos is still out, in the world, especially in older buildings. Uh, so exposure can continue to occur. Um, is there a, a reason why there's that 1978 uh, cutoff when discussing claims? Oh, that 1978 cutoff was just an Got example it. for one particular product, um, and that's drywall joint compound contained asbestos until it was banned in 1978. Um, and, but we now know actually contained asbestos beyond that because they substituted asbestos with talc at the time, which we now know contained asbestos. So uh, that 1978 was particular to one particular product. Um, no, exposures continue to happen today. Um, exposures have never stopped happening in the United States, um, even after particular products banned, or the use of asbestos was banned in particular products, and um, asbestos claims will unfortunately continue for many years to come. So, you, you, you know, th this is kind of funny, because we were sitting around chatting earlier, and when Dawn first got, got out of law school, now I'm dating you, what, yeah. tw tw 20, 20 years ago, yeah, she interviewed with ago. the firm, and she was told that asbestos litigation was going to end in the near future. And, and so I unfortunately, go interview at an asbestos firm because yeah. I, I wouldn't have job security. Yeah, and, and, and unfortunately, it hasn't gone away. Um, you know, I think a lot of people read about Johnson & Johnson as an example. Uh, their baby powder contained asbestos in it up until them taking it off the shelf, I guess it was two years ago? Two or three years ago. Yeah, FDA had them pull it off the shelf. But unfortunately, products have continued to be sold in the U.S. that contain asbestos. And quite frankly, we import products from all over the world, Korea, China, everywhere else. And I, I imagine all sorts of products still contain asbestos. And we'll, we'll see this litigation and, and unfortunately, people getting this disease for a long time. We'll take uh, one last question. We're uh, out of time. Just one more. I'm curious about the trusts. Since they were established a while ago and the claims continue, are the payouts from the trusts going down? Will they run out of money um, for patients that get diagnosed as we you know, go down in further in the years? So they, they've gone down over time. 
and unfortunately with investments, uh, investment returns going down here in, in recent times, they'll probably go down even lower. And because, you know, that's a lot of what they're paying the money out based on, you know, what they're predicting over the course of the next 30, 40 years. Um, and when the investment returns aren't as good, then they, they lower their payouts. But I, I think almost every trust fund, I'm trying to think of any that, that hasn't, but I think they've almost all gone down over time. Um, so they're paying less and less. Johns Manville, I think originally, because they thought uh, the number of people getting mesothelioma was gonna start to drop off, and I'm, I'm really dating myself here, but I think they were predicting that in 2005, um, the number of mesothelioma patients would drop off, and, and so they, they used to pay $26,250 to people that had claims against Johns Manville. Now they're paying $17,850, and you know their are metrics that they used. I mean they're they're off, and and they haven't gone down, and so that's why they've decreased the amount of payments. So, and that'll probably continue. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'd like to thank Neil and Greg and Don for. Uh, presenting that information to us.